Now we're going to talk about the knee and the arm. So, supracondylar fractures. As you all know, more com most common at around six years of age. Uh, extension type is most common. And posterior medial displacement is most common. And so, if you look at this, this is posterior medial displacement. Sorry, this one's posterior medial displacement. And um, uh, when it displaces medially, it goes into varus, goes into extension, and internal rotation. And so if you don't, if you have posterior medial displacement and you don't do any correction or you get only part of a correction, then you have a setup for cubitus varus. So here's the complication, cubitus varus in this young man. Um, we know this is a distal humeral deformity. It's in varus, extension, and internal rotation. And this has been shown in multiple studies. The deformity is due to varus tilt, not translation or significant rotation. Um, that has been shown by many, many people. Internal rotation certainly can contribute to the deformity. And if you want to measure it, you can use this technique as being illustrated there. So if you have the child bending over and you put the arm behind their back and you ask them to lift their wrist off their back, the distance they can lift off is internal rotation. And you compare that to the contralateral limb and you can get an estimate about how much internal rotation is present. So what's the cause? Well. Lack of reduction or loss of satisfactory reduction leads to this problem. Um, one nice paper by Perron showed that the incidence was 8% with cast immobilization and only 2% with pin fixation. And so here we see you just have to achieve a good reduction here. It's critical. And you should be able to achieve it well over 90% of the time without having to go on to an open reduction. And then once you've achieved the reduction, you need to stabilize it. And we all know the rules. You can use two pins laterally. They have to be separated. There has to be good spread. There has to be good bite on both cortices. And on the lateral, I like to see spread on the lateral. I don't like to see the pins completely overlapped. If there's a spread, then it's stronger. And then check the, uh, the, the, um, the stability on, an, on, a, on, on the image intensifier, do a flexion and extension, make sure that distal fragment isn't moving and that it's stable. So here's a lousy result. Um, mediocre reduction, um, pins are low, the two lower ones are transverse, one's probably in the fracture, um, there's uh, no engagement by the divergent pin. It's just sitting loose in the canal. Well, we all know what's going to happen to this, and it's already displaced. How do you measure it? Well, you measure Bowman's angle, which we know there's quite um, significant variation um, uh, between people, but right-left is quite consistent. So you can con compare with the Bowman angle on the other side. And then we know that the anterior humeral line should go through the middle of the capitellum and there should be an anterior um, uh, angle of the capitellum with the long axis. So, medial growth arrest. So, reduced growth on the medial side or increased growth on the lateral side or trochlear osteonecrosis can cause cubitus varus. Um, in the 36 that were described in Boston by Voss, they found four were clearly um, shown sign of overgrowth. And, you know, we know if you look, um, uh, it's very interesting. Fractures or surgery around a joint causes massive hyperemia. There was a nice study that showed that when you did a proximal femoral osteotomy, the blood supply to the pelvis and the adjacent acetabulum dramatically increased. And so we know that there are, are things that can happen with hyperemia. And in the same way, 
the damage to a blood vessel causing trochlear osteonecrosis can also create this. So here's an example of a transficeal supracondylar fracture in a young child. It was unrecognized, not treated appropriately, and ended up with a varus deformity. And the varus deformity was progressive. And it was related to probably the growth abnormality on the medial side. So this results in cosmetic deformity and functional loss. There's elbow hyperextension because the distal fragments in extension and there's reduced flexion. So the same arc is just displaced into extension. And then there's varus alignment and internal rotation. So the long-term issues are interesting. The abnormal mechanical axis as leads to symptomatic posterior lateral instability. Um, that was first described by, I think, Sean O'Driscoll. Um, there is ulnar neuropathy. So you can get a tardy ulnar nerve palsy from varus and valgus. And we know that it sets you up for lateral condylar fractures. So here's a child who is, um, has a mild um, cubitus varus from a previous fracture. and lateral condylar fracture, and then more varus, either by stimulation of growth or malreduction, I can't say for sure. So how do you evaluate this? Well, you do an x-ray. Well, this will show you it, but this shows you it better. Long, long arm views, you get a better um, estimate of the carrying angle. So what's the treatment? Well, most of these are just observed, right? Most of these are not corrected surgically. Um, and I'll show an example of something there. Um, surgical lateral hemiopithesis. So if you think that it's overgrowth and it's progressing long after the fracture's healed, well, you could put an eight plate on it. And that will at least stabilize it. And if it's left on long enough and there's not a problem with medial growth, then you might get some correction as well. Osteotomy, there are many different described, and I'll, I'll review some of them, but the, the workhorse is the lateral closing wedge. Um, the problem with all these osteotomies is a very high complication rate, stiffness, nerve injury, and recurrence. So, look at this child. That was a uh, non-accidental. This was a child abuse fracture that was untreated and this is part way to union. Isn't that amazing? And here it is healed. And it was remodeling quite well. Um, the arm was reasonably well aligned. There wasn't too much extension. And uh, it was decided to observe this. So here's a cubitus varus after a fracture, um, treated with closed reduction and casting. So 9% of these go on to cubitus varus. Here's the example of the, um, of the osteotomy you can use. And this graphic um, shows how you should do the osteotomy. Because if you do the osteotomy up here, transverse, then you end up with prominence laterally. If you, if you direct the, um, uh, the triangle distally, then the apex here is down near the cora. So when you close this, there won't be as much um, lateral prominence. And if you keep the limbs of the osteotomy in similar size, that reduces it as well. And so here's an example of where you might do the osteotomy. You put the pins in um, the lateral side, the medial side, um, sorry, lateral side to um, um, be ready when you close, when you remove the wedge, you close down, you can immediately put in the wires. And um, so here's the example of the stabilization. There was a little offset here because we achieved a little external rotation at the same time. And then there's the final result. Um, I read a paper that said that if you use a lateral step plate, um, it might be better results um, than a K-wire. And then here's the result. 
So um, uh, this is an old technique that was described um, using two screws and a, and a wire, and uh, it's very effective. Um, this is um, uh, from the same article that shows um, if you don't do the wedge right, see the lateral prominence that occurs. Um, you can use an Lizaroff. Uh, here's a beautiful example of gradual correction. And I think this is a triumph of technique over reason. Um, uh, here's an example of a dome osteotomy, very elegant. Um, was done successfully by these people at a relatively high complication rate. And again, is probably more than you need. Um, these are very elegant osteotomies, but um, uh, require a large exposure and have a higher complication rate. So, um, the answer to the question is that rotational deformity does play a role, but it does not play an important role in the deformity of cubic spheres. Thank you very much.